All right. We are off to the race. It is great to be here with my dear friend, the Bradster. We are in the recording studio for the Center for Excellence in Theology. And Brother Bradster, thank you for being with me this day. And it is such a pleasure to talk with you this day about the good things of God. How are you doing and how has your day been? Oh, just another day of being a tribal Calvinist that can't stand anything other than the doctrines of grace. Joking. How about you, my brother? Are you learning some new tricks here with the software and the editing? Yeah, I really I really am still trying to get my sea legs with recording software and video editing software. It's a learning process, and sometimes that frustrates me because I just want to learn something quickly rather than maybe learn what I need to do. But uh, God gives grace, and computers require you that you accept them on their terms rather than they fit into the reality that you would like them to fit in. So I'm having fun with it is what I'm trying to say, my brother. And uh, we've got a beautiful topic for today. We're going to talk about the doctrines of grace for a third time. Now, in our first episode talking, brother, we went through and spent some time with the doctrine of imputation, and we went through the passage in Romans chapter 5 together, verses 12 to 21, that beautiful passage. It talks about original sin and also talks about uh, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ to the account of the saved sinner for the benefit of the person God saves. And then in second discussion, we had a chance to talk about Augustine's idea his doctrine of divine grace and the human anthropology. What is humankind like? When we come to the Bible and read it, are we basically good people? Are we neutral or are we something else? And we went through Augustine's formulation, his full fourfold state of humankind and talked about that. So for me, those are two of the big three, maybe cornerstones of the doctrines of grace and I think one of the other major cornerstones is what we're going to talk about here today, and that's this idea of Protestant evangelicalism. And by that, we mean contrasted with something that is called clericalism, something that is called sacerdotalism is another word for it. You'll see it in the Roman Catholic Church predominantly. Sometimes you'll see it in some strands of Lutheranism. And if you ever wondered what was the difference between a pastor, for example, and a priest? It very often comes down to this evangelical, sacerdotal distinction, and I think it's an important part of our doctrines of grace. And so let me throw it over to you, my friend, for just some, some backgrounds here on this topic that we love to talk about together. Can you enlighten me on the terms again? Yeah, so you have this idea of this evangelicalism versus sacerdotalism. So a pastor is evangelical. Uh, he administers the sacraments, but he believes that what he's doing when he administers the sacraments is showing forth a means of grace that God has given, but they are a show indicating the kinds of things that are really illustrating what God's Holy Spirit is doing behind the scenes. This is contrasted with the sacerdotal approach, which is you have this with priests, especially in a Roman Catholic, sometimes with Lutherans, sometimes with, with Anglican or Episcopalian ideas. And here is this idea that the church is the successor to God's plan of salvation. So in the church age, Jesus came and he kicked off the church age. He started it, but now he's gone. He has ascended to heaven and he has left the church to continue his work. And so the church has, you'll hear people say on the sacerdotal side, the church has the keys to the kingdom. The church has the right to act in a manner representing God in these matters of salvation and the administration and power and virtue of the sacraments. And that's contrasted with what we are on our side, which is evangelical, which is the idea that, yes, we do and perform these sacraments and we minister these means of grace, but we don't see the church as the successor to Christ. We see uh, the Holy Spirit as the prime mover and actor in moving forward the kingdom of God. So that's just a high-level overview, overview, brother. 
Absolutely. Christ is the head of the church. Often people could take the phrase Christ is the head of the church as like a really ni nice little cliche type of thing. But we know that means so much more. That means that we know that God is the one that institutes who is in charge of his word. And we know that is the Holy Spirit. Regardless of what people say, God is always in control. And the scriptures point to this. From the scriptures, we see that it's not an institution over God, but it's God dictating the methods in which he institutes things. Yeah, so my friend, it's, it might be helpful for the listeners to maybe just reference what we're talking about in more detail. And to do that, I have the blessing and the benefit of B.B. Warfield's writing, chapter 3, from his book, The Plan of Salvation, and it's about the differences between being an evangelical versus being sacerdotal. And so he's going to raise the big issues and talk about the important distinction. So the first thing to distinguish that, that Warfield notes is that throughout the Reformation period, the Reformation happened in a sacerdotal context. So by the time the High Middle Ages has come around, we really see that in terms of popularity or in terms of the number of groups, sacerdotalism is the primary view. And so people have this idea, so thinking about salvation and what's going on, how is it that as history unfolds, people will come to Christ? What are the, what are the details? What are the themes? How does it happen? And basically, you've got these two different ideas or tendencies. So in the church, mature theology has always declared that salvation is holy of God, and he alone can save. But coming down as the context in which the Reformation reacted, there was the large portion of the church that thought that God, in working salvation, did not operate on the human soul directly but only indirectly. That is to say, God set up a system. He set up instruments. He established a means by which his saving grace is communicated to men. Now, this is the, we're describing the sacerdotal position here that the Reformers are going to react against. But, uh, but first, let's talk about what that is. And so the idea here is that these are there are these means of grace. There are these instrumentalities that God has commissioned and committed to human hands for administration. And so the idea here is that there's a human factor between the saving grace of God and its effective operation in the souls of men. And so that's the sacerdotal system. And that's the system that the Protestant church is going to largely reject in favor of a different understanding. So how is it different? How is evangelicalism, our position, different from the sacerdotalism of the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, developed through that historical context? The idea from the Reformers is this idea that God himself is the immediate actor. He interacts and works by his grace directly on the souls of men. He doesn't work through a middleman, and he has not He's not suspended any man's salvation, Warfield writes, upon the faithfulness or the lack of faithfulness of individuals in the church. So let's suppose that God desires the person down the street should be saved. Under this sacerdotal idea, God has set up an instrument. He set up his church. He's handed over the sacraments to people who continue his saving work. And so if priest so-and-so down the street is having a nice dinner, and there's person X who God would like to have saved, then there's some question in which that, that, is gonna, that meeting is going to have to happen. And in some sense, the priest make, is the necessary piece to communicate this grace. If that person is going to be saved in the sacerdotal view, that priest is going to have to be involved in it. And what if the priest is on vacation? What if he's on the golf course? You know, what if he's just having a really great dinner and he doesn't feel like it? Now, that's a little bit 
that's a little bit over the top there, and I should walk back from that. But we're, we start to see about this immediate idea of salvation. So, brother, is that enough to kickstart some ideas in your brain? No, absolutely. Some terms get lost, and it's good to know because so much history is behind these teachings. Like a lot of times when you hear these type of terms being used, you just think Reformation, Martin Luther, you think the five solas, you think how Rome went against all those truths that really brought forth the Reformation with the 95 Theses by Martin Luther in regards to empathy and an authority over God's Word that is not God Himself. And one thing that I would like to one thing that I would like to point out is that uh, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, not not Bradster, not J. C. Bear, not whoever the Pope is right now. That Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority. And whenever it, it comes to sacrament, when it comes to these type of things, a lot of people wouldn't even know what a sacrament is because at a Protestant church, they would be called like Lord's Supper. If you're lucky, if you're lucky enough, you would be in a church that says ordinance. And quite often, these differences from what I've experienced in the short time I've been a Christian are really just not spoken of a lot. And the main thing is that Jesus and his word and the gospel is the main thrust. And when you have this, that the Bible ultimately is put in the proper respect, at least on the Protestant end of this conversation. Thank you for that, my friend. So Warfield talks about, and we're outlining what the sacerdotalist position is here, not affirming it in case anybody should be confused, but Warfield is outlining this worldview that the sacerdotalists have. The church, Warfield writes, has taken over the work of Christ. It is, in a real sense, a reincarnation of Christ to continue and to complete his redemptive mission. Through his church, he continues to execute his office of prophet, priest, and king. So the church is continuing Christ's work in a prophetic sense, by witnessing the truth, and by interpreting and determining doctrine with an infallible authority that carries the same weight and assurance as his own original revelation. That is to say, the church is an infallible authority that succeeds him on earth in the exercise of his prophetic office, and it has the same weight and assurance as the testimony of the Scriptures in this sacerdotalist view. Now, it also succeeds him in Christ's priestly office. So there is no salvation outside of that visible organization. Now, this is why in a sacerdotal mindset, the Mass is so important, because this is a... Con so Jesus's ministry is celebrated in the Mass, and in their thinking, Christ is contained and immolated in an unbloody manner on the altar of the cross, in a sacrifice that is truly propitiatory. And then finally, the church acts to be a political entity, a kingly power of Christ on earth. It has an absolute claim to the obedience of its members in matters of faith and duty. It has a right and a duty to punish people for breaking laws, and to use force over and against those who will not be reconciled. So this is the sacerdotal worldview. This is the system. You understand, again, we're not affirming this view. We're just laying out the position of it so that people can understand the contrast that we're going to follow up with. But you have to understand, throughout the Middle Ages, when the Roman Empire fell, almost every single significant institution from antiquity, stopped working. So the Roman order had set up and conquered in a large part of Europe and had created this culture and civilization with norms, with institutions, with courts of law, systems of justice, ways of doing things, ideas about the world that greatly affected 
and unified the world of antiquity in a way that Europe had not been unified before. But then in the Middle Ages, after the fall of Rome in the West and the dissolving of the Roman Empire, that unity was fragmented. And now, in place of one way of doing things, you have this pluralism. And by the way, does this sound familiar to students who are living in times like today? You have the fall of this organized, unified culture, and it's splintering into all of these new things that are going to go in all these different ways. And so the point is, from a, to a sacerdotalist, the church became the culture of last resort. And so in the midst of a godless culture, in the midst of a culture that you could not trust any of the established norms, the church provided that foundation. And indeed, when you were talking with a member of the magisterium, you were talking with a successor to Christ himself. And so you have people in the sacerdotal view walking the earth with a kind of divine right of the king, speaking with him with the same authority of even that of the Holy Scripture. So that's just a high-level overview, and hopefully it makes it a little more clear some of the motivations behind what Christians were thinking when they developed this doctrine. Now, Bradster, you and I are going to talk about how the Reformers took it in a different direction. But I think first we have to say, we have to say what the other major direction was before we talk more about where the Reformers went. How would you build on top of that? Yeah, it's remarkable how, com how it's the complete opposite of everything that we would say is what Christianity is all about. And when you don't see how blessed you are now, you don't really appreciate it the way you would if you understood these things that J.C. Bear is talking about, because you really don't understand how blessed you are without this type of a knowledge, because things had to be a certain way. But you also see that there's a certain reason why they had to be this way. I find that remarkable as well. And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not justifying the view of sacerdotalism. I'm saying that it served a certain purpose for a certain time. So there's an essence here, and to be fair, we want to make clear that in the sacerdotalist worldview, God truly desires the salvation of all men in the sense that he has made an adequate provision for their salvation in this magisterial church with its sacramental system. So Jesus Christ, the King, has come to earth and after his death, burial, resurrection, and then ascension, he's not done with his kingdom. The kingdom work moves on, but the kingdom work moves on through this visible church. And the supernatural means is the sacramental system. And so it's a system of second causes. And the idea is that by conveying the sacraments to particular people at particular times or withholding them, God is exercising his general provision for the government of the world. And the actual distribution of the grace of God lies outside of this direct involvement on his part. And so in the sacerdotalist worldview, those who are saved and those who are lost, it comes down to what has happened with them and the means, the sacraments. And so it's not a divine appointment. It's a natural working of secondary causes. God has this antecedent conditional will, is the technical term, that all should be saved. However, he mediates it. The person who is to be saved must receive grace through the sacraments that are distributed through a government, a kingdom on earth that he has set up here this magisterial kingdom. It's, in this sense, God is relieved from all responsibility to the inequality of the distribution of saving grace. God is not directly in the predestination business. He's not picking person A or B. He's put his church into the world, and his magisterial kingdom is moving things forward. And in that regard, the outworkings of the events of history will show that person A will come to faith and be administered the sacraments and remain in that magisterial system, while person B will not. 
And that is the difference. As opposed to how some sacerdotalists would think of it, the unfairness of God in directly predestining a soul for salvation. And so you see here that all are not saved isn't due to the fact that God does not predestine all for salvation, but it's a failure on the part of those to receive the grace of the sacrament. And it's a failure solely due to these secondary causes, the working of a general cause. And so to the outsider, it means that God made salvation possible, and he's set up that system to be administered through this this magisterium of priests, cardinals, pope, (laughs) we'll get into there, and then he leaves it to nature for salvation to be worked through. And so there's the Warfield cites a Jesuit writer here, William Humphrey, and in particular with this idea, this special case of what happens for an infant who might die without being baptized and therefore would be lost, not having been able to participate in this sacramental system. And so we see this is one of the this is one of the corner cases for sacerdotalism that's really tricky. And this Jesuit writes that because of original sin and the infection of the whole human race, God, in his mercy, wills the restoration, and he destines and sends his son, and then wills that Christ should make a full satisfaction. So Christ does give an offering for all human sins. And so the restored human race, all are comprehended and understand it of this. The redemption of all infants, for example, are set out in this plan. So God's divine will accept what Christ has done. There's a virtue, there's a sacrifice in the original sin. These infants who receive the sacraments are selected. So these are provisions, but they're natural provisions, and this can give rise to this deistic mindset. If you remember, Bradster, late in the Middle Ages, maybe around the time of the Renaissance, up into the century or two before the Enlightenment, you have this very rationalistic view of the universe. And the idea here is God is like a watchmaker. So a watchmaker puts a watch together, and then he winds the watch up. But once he puts the watch together and winds it up and gets the watch started— the watchmaker isn't making the individual tick tick that drives that watch to continue to keep an accurate time. And so, too, in this rationalistic, deistic view, God has wound up the mission of the church like a watchmaker has created and set up the conditions for the watch, but it's actually the watch that's ticking and performing things. And so, too, the church is doing that. So hopefully this is understood that there's a natural order. And as a part of that, God wills to provide for infants and for other human beings. And so this is where this is where paedo-baptism starts to come into being really important. I, and I don't mean to say that paedo-baptism only was established in the Middle Ages, but I'm saying with the sacerdotal thinking. And men should seek the magisterial kingdom that God has set up. And it has an authority, it has a theocracy to it, and if you're looking for another way of salvation, you're going to be in trouble, because in a sacerdotalist view, God has set this system up and isn't particularly doing other things to advance the kingdom. And so we get into, we get into a clericalism, there's a tendency for a priestly class to emerge separate from the average person, separate from the lay person, the lay individual, the priestly class, people in the magisterium tend to be well-educated, tend to be trained, tend to be have this doctrinal unification. They're swearing allegiance and fealty to this visible church, and that explains how and why and where and when uh, the church in Christendom has moved for so many centuries. So, We're going to talk about how the Reformers went back to the Scriptures and refreshed the Church in the Reformation against these sacerdotal principles. So, Bradster, it's it's a really different mindset, isn't it? And if you haven't been exposed to it before, it's difficult to put into words until you've 
uh, understood some of these basic bedrock foundations and principles. Absolutely. It's, it's something brand new for a lot of people, and they may not find the benefit of this, but for me, and I'm not saying this as if I'm anything, but for me, this is extremely edifying because it connects the dots so many different ways for the explanations the Reformers gave, as well as the different ways people have interpreted the Bible. And if they are truly borrowing from this sacerdotalism or the scriptures. Thank you, my friend. Now, before we get to the Protestant response, I just want to give a flavor for maybe why some of this reason, reasoning came about. So it's not my contention that sacerdotalists are crazy. <laughs> it's my contention. We, they confess Christ. They confess the Trinity. They confess the means of grace in sacraments, which we also confess. We just have a different understanding of how it is that the kingdom is advancing through the world. One of the main issues here in the sacerdotalist way of thought is that humankind plays this vital a priori role. Now, we're going to get to the Protestant response here, but I first want to just read a couple of passages and verses to give a flavor for where some sacerdotalists were reading and why they maybe went in the direction they went. So one of the classic passages is Matthew chapter 16, and we'll read here verses 13 to 23. And so this is Peter's confession of the Messiah. And it starts like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples, it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, Lord, no, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concern, but human concern. And so this is one of the most important passages, Bradster, thinking about why sacerdotalists have gone where they have gone. And so in particular, there are a couple of phrases here that sacerdotal friends will, will will emphasize. So one is that Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Now, if you just read this passage, perhaps, one could see that maybe Jesus is establishing an earthly theocracy with some sort of apostolic succession. His apostles are not just his disciples in this mindset and view, but they're actually the core of his new aristocratic class in his new theocratic kingdom, a literal visible kingdom that exists on heaven and on earth in a political sense. And Jesus is saying, you have authority. The way that you do it here on earth will be reflected up in heaven. What's that saying? That means that in the discharge of these duties, God is going to recognize and ratify and honor what it is, Peter, that you do. 
in your life. And so you could see how if you were if you were not, if you did not subscribe to the doctrines of grace, in particular the Augustinian notions as the reformers understood it of the total depravity of humankind. If you think that human nature is basically good or relatively good or often good or can be good in some theocratic way or sense, then why not? Jesus is putting people in. He's advancing his kingdom. It's very visible. It's very tangible. But where the reformers rebelled against this view is in considering a systematic picture. This isn't the only passage in the scriptures. And in fact, there are other reasons to think that this is not a good reading and a good understanding. Now, before we get to that, let me read a couple of other passages that sacerdotalists think maybe supports their view. So in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of the one who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And so again, you have this idea of this kingdom administered by this aristocratic class, commissioned by the Lord Jesus. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22 says this, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Now we have the passage that you and I just read recently in Matthew 18, 18, reinforcing this. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. John chapter 20, verse 23 says, If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. And so we're going to start pushing back now on this idea from the reformers, I think the first thing that, that we want to do is we first of all want to acknowledge the prima facie case for sacerdotalists. In other words, our sacerdotalist friends are not completely crazy. If one takes certain preconditions and brings a certain worldview to bear, some of these passages seem to validate that. And that's all we're saying. Bradster, we don't want anybody sending us nasty grams saying that we're agreeing with a sacerdotalist. We don't. But the point is, there are some people on our side in the evangelical camp who have this idea that it is so absolutely obvious that only evangelicalism is the, is the only possible way that anybody could ever read their scriptures and understand them, that one would have to be an idiot or foolish or stupid or unfaithful in their commitment to the Word of God, to even find some of these principles. No, we're not saying that, but we do have to say that there are at least some figments in here that, that lend some support at a high level, even if you and I are going to point out that's ultimately not going to hold. So what did you think about that, my friend? It's extremely interesting. The more you learn about history in regards to the Christian faith, the more you see that we all are operating on faith. Now, we see the misuses in regards to faith, but at the same time, we can tell that the focus is Christ, at least in the sense that he is God, that he is holy, that he is separate. And really, I would say the condemnation would fall on the head of someone teaching against Christ's teachings, not necessarily those who are exposed to these teachings. If this is all you know, and that people really are exalting Jesus Christ's name, the triune God, and you're seeing John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, full of grace and truth. When, if we see this being proclaimed from a Roman Catholic or a Greek Orthodox, it's hard to say, hey, you're not a believer in this Christ. But we do know that there are things that we should not compromise. Once we have a deeper look into the scriptures, there's only one mediator between God and man. That's the man Christ Jesus. And that the Spirit gives life, not, a, not an institution. And when you look back at these scriptures, yes, 
with a wealth of information out there. Peter, in our minds, could have clearly been John, could have clearly been James, could have clearly been any of the disciples. Because the main point is disciples. Go and make disciples. That's the main point. And you are, everything that you say is held under account for by God. God is above you. So it's really zeroing in that God is the one above you. And as far as the key, we know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. And to a certain extent, we have to say that they know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, because they're not saying that some other God is. And until the moment that they do, this is how I put it. You are my brother until you prove to be another. What do you think of that, J.C. Bear? My friend, I love that. There's one more interesting historical nugget, and then we're going to start responding to our sacerdotalist brothers from our evangelical position. Here's the nugget. What else is the historical context behind sacerdotalist original understandings? In antiquity, books were scarce. Copies of the scriptures were scarce. I'm lucky. I have a library in my living room here with hundreds of books. In antiquity, it was not unusual for the average community to have only one copy of the Holy Scriptures, and that at the synagogue or at the monastery. And books were often like, what were they like? They were like sports cars. People wanted to get in them and drive away with them. (laughs) And so if you look at actually book construction in this period prior to the printing press and the Gutenberg Revolution, you have things like books would come bound with chain so that you could chain a book to a pulpit or a pedestal or a location. Why? Because otherwise they would get up and walk off in the middle of the night. They were so desired and they were so rare relative to the way we think about books today. Brother, when people visit me in my library, every now and again, somebody will look through some of the titles to see if they see something interesting. I've never had somebody come into my house for the purpose of finding a choice book and robbing me of it. So this idea in antiquity is strange to us today. And so an outworking and an outcropping of this was that people who had actually read the Holy Scriptures were fairly rare. Literacy rates were low in comparison to today. And so in a community, there might only be 10%, 15 or 20% of the people in that community who were very proficient at reading. And the other 80% could read some things to some degree, but not at a great level, at least not like we think of today is common. And so sacerdotalism almost makes sense that it, sh- that it might develop, that this approach might become the way people think about things. Now, again, I'm not defending it. I'm just pointing out that when you take a look at history, the reason why doctrines have the shape they do very often goes back to the forces that shaped them. And so in the world of the pre-printing press, in the world of a scarce Bible, you have this priestly class, you have this clerical class, you have, it's very relatively few and rare for people to have much knowledge regarding the scriptures directly from their own reading, and you have this reliance upon the clergy. And so you can see how it can be very natural for something like a sacerdotalism to develop. Now, having said that, it's time to start responding. And one of the first things that that evangelicals will point out, and rightly so, is what do the scriptures say this action is? Now, we've read a couple of passages, and if you were living in a time when you didn't own your own Bible, but you had to rely upon, there was one copy of the scriptures, and it was down in the monastery down the street, and you had to go talk to the priest to find out what it said, and you had to make an appointment with him, like you have to make an appointment with your doctor, and you go and you get five minutes with him, and you have all these questions. What's God's, what's God, what does he require of me? What has to happen and what should go on? It's perhaps no wonder that such a thing, such a system might come out of this. But what we have, the miracle of the Protestant Reformation, cannot be separated from the fact of the Gutenberg Revolution. So with the invention of the printing press, I believe 
it was in the 15th century, so the 1400s, was the Gutenberg Press, I believe. I'm going to have to go back and check that. But the point is, at that time, what was scarce now became common. And books started to become accessible in a way that, that we're familiar with today, which is to say much more common. So within 100 years of this, you go from people having an, a knowledge and understanding of the Bible being a scarce thing to it being starting to become a commodity. So what are some of the changes here? First of all, you don't, in an age where you can go online and be your own doctor and go on YouTube and watch some videos about your lumbago or your other medical conditions, it changes the doctor-patient relationship and dynamic. Now, that's sometimes for the good, that's sometimes for the bad, but it's different. And doctors today, when they relate to their patients, they sometimes face patients who are much more well-trained or almost can be peers or at a similar level of knowledge of and understanding in some matters. And so it is, too, because of the Protestant Re Reformation, the revolution in the availability of Bibles changes the understanding of theology. More people are looking at the text. More people are, are creating and coming up with these systematic ideas of what the texts are really saying. And so the Protestant Reformation can't be separated from that. You have Luther, and then in a generation later, Calvin, and many others, having this system now where lots of people are reading Bibles in a way that was brand new to the world. It had never seen such a thing. And now people are reading the Scriptures and going to the priest and saying, excuse me, Mr. Priest, you said A, but look what it says here in the book of Romans, or what does it say in the Gospel of John, or, or look, I have a copy of the Psalms, and how does your understanding fit with that? And so this is the big key. Now, in terms of an actual response, here's what reformers and other Protestants started to talk about with sacerdotalists. I'm going to go to John chapter 3. Now, in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, and there is this famous question, answer, session. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus says, <laughs> how can anyone be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? No, he's not asking that because he's asking informationally. He's laughing. He's ridiculing. He's mocking. He's scorning. Jesus, that's stupid. Who can go into a mother's womb a second time? Now, Jesus answers this way. Truly, I tell you, Unless someone is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And now with a passage like this, we start to see a different idea emerge. Remember the earlier passage we read? In where Jesus, in the minds of sacerdotalists, Jesus commissions Peter and says, Peter, you're it. You're the rock. I'm building my church on you. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. You have authority. And now we have this text here in John chapter 3 that says, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound. You don't know where it comes from where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And boom, you've got a different imagination or ideation of what's happening in salvation. No longer are you just limited to Peter and his apostolic successors maintaining this magisterial order. Now you have this thought that all along, the successor to Jesus' ministry in the world was not Peter, was not any human. The successor was the Holy Spirit, who was given in a beautiful way at Pentecost. And now you have this different successor, and what's happening? How is salvation happening? The Spirit is driving it. It's not the visible church. It's not the magisterial church. It's not Cardinal so-and-so or Pope, what's his name, walking down the street and deciding in his own best efforts, I'm going to apply this sacrament, and then God's will in salvation will be done for this person. No, 
The wind blows where it pleases. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working directly in the lives of the people being saved. Now, we're going to go into another key passage here for the evangelical view in Acts chapter 8 in just a second. But first, I just wanted to throw over to my brother Bradster and get some ideas to bounce off of with that. It's such a shame that most people would hear Roman Catholicism and just say, hey, screw these people. They're so foolish. We see so much history here, so much that God had to have worked through. Everything serves a righteous purpose. And look at how it led to this moment. This moment that I'm alluding to is right now. Look at how we have internet. Look at how we have so many articles and books. Like J.C. Bear was talking about his library, people would be like, I could just get the Kindle edition. Life is so different. We see a blessing as a curse these days instead of of for what it really is. And what it really is, is if you appreciate truth, you go all the way back to these times by listening, by, by hearing what is actually going on throughout these times. People used to have very little. It's amazing. Think about the providence from the Bible. It's amazing the wonder that we even have the Bible. You had a neighborhood that would rule over the scriptures. Oh yeah, we could condemn that one place that had the Bible available. But at the same time, at the very same time, what do we have? They got to hear the Bible. Hearing and Believing is a gift from God, and he found a way even through the midst of the medieval time, even through all the restraints mankind would put and the abuse mankind would exercise over the authority of the word of God as if they had the right to do this, as if any interpretation of a single text could do Well, if you don't have all the texts, How can you say, hey, these evil people doing these evil things, five minutes of Mr. Pastor Guy is all you get? You can't relate to that. You can't understand that. And until you understand the wealth of what you have now because of God's providence, because of the way he blessed the nations, because of the progressive growth throughout time, you'll really never get it without putting history in its context. Throw it back over to you, J.C. Bear. Thank you, my friend. We've read some passages that might seem at the surface to support this sacerdotalist understanding. But I want to read a passage where I think we actually see an example of how God advances his kingdom in the world. So first of all, we have the John 3 testimony. So it's the Holy Spirit and not Peter and not an apostolic line of popes who has succeeded Jesus' ministry here on earth. Now, how does it work? How is the kingdom advanced? The scriptures give us a beautiful example, and I think the reformers had to show this when they were developing the understanding, and it was different. They had their copy of the scriptures, and they went to their priest and said, I don't see a difference between you and me in God's kingdom. You're not a privileged person. You don't have access to privileges powers, rights, duties that that I don't have. I'm the same as you. And so we have this priesthood of believers principle, meaning that all people are related to Christ in the same way, as opposed to some people have special access. Now, here's the passage, and I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read part of it. This is Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. This is the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian official. So an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a high official of the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem. He was sitting in his chariot on the way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go, and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, the eunuch said, unless someone guides me. So he read the passage, and then Philip proceeded to tell him 
the good news about Jesus, starting with that scripture from Isaiah that he was reading. Now the eunuch receives it, and they're traveling by the road, and they come to some water, and the eunuch says, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Now, there are elements here that perhaps a sacerdotalist might point and say, see, this is what I'm talking about. The kingdom advances because Philip is going and moving and doing and acting. So here Philip is administering the sacrament of baptism. And because of that, the eunuch is saved. But there's another very painful to that position. There's another very painful observation that we really have to see and address. Who's initiating and joining the entire thing? Well, an angel of the Lord appears to Philip and gives him the instructions. So Philip is not the boss. It wasn't Philip's idea to go down the Jerusalem road to Gaza. It wasn't Philip's idea when he got up in the morning and said, I'm going to find an Ethiopian eunuch. I'm going to show him that passage in Isaiah. And then he's, and then I'm going to baptize him because he's going to believe. No, what we see, of course, is that God's Spirit is superintending the entire thing. And what does that mean? Rather than putting a magisterium in charge here, I think this passage shows that the church relates to God moving and acting in the world in a different manner. So yes, we are his church. We are his bride and the passages that we read before that seem to some to sacerdotalists to support this successor theocratic kingdom, this magisterium. I think we've got something else in mind here. And when I read this chapter, Acts 8, it reminded me, Bradster, it's, I don't know how common it is today, but when I grew up, lots of, lots of communities had take your son to work day, take your daughter to work. And so what parents would do is they would take their little one into the office and they would walk around the office and they would see, oh, this is where mommy works. This is where daddy works. Oh, daddy, here you're, here's you doing this. Here's you doing that. And they would get this idea. And really, when I read Acts chapter 8, that's the sense that I get here, is that it is the Spirit who is moving. And in the case of Philip, the Spirit is instructing him go do this, go do that, talk to this man. And it's the activity of the Spirit that matters. And it's, the, it's this initiating action of God that's happening. And if a bricklayer takes his young son to work, and he says, here, little Timmy, here's how I, here's how I lay a brick and build a wall. So here, pick this brick up, put some mortar on it, and then go ahead and set it in its place on the wall, now tap it in, make sure the mortar is leveled out there. Here, take another brick, get some more mortar, scrape it on with the trowel, move it here, align it there. Little Timmy puts two or three brick into the wall that his dad is building. And then little Timmy goes home at night and he says, Mom, I had a great time. I helped dad build that wall. That's great. But who built that wall? That was clearly dad's work. And yes, little Timmy helped. And yes, little Timmy put a brick in here or there. But it was always under the watchful superintending of dad. And if little Timmy would have made a mistake or would have done something that would have jeopardized the integrity of the wall, dad was going to step in and was going to keep that from happening. It's his wall. It's his thing that he's building. And little Timmy got to share and take have a little taste, have a little insight into what it is that God, that we see here, Philip gets a little taste into and insight into what God, the Holy Spirit is doing in an active sense when he blows around the earth like the wind moving from here to there. And so I was really touched by that passage, brother. And I know that's got to be something that is special to you. Let, what do you think about that story and how it relates? It's the whole entire question that comes to mind when you're dealing with Catholicism as a whole. And, I've, and of course, I'm talking about the teachings, the differences in the teachings. Is there a divine authorship that man has to claim the authority that he takes? 
if you don't have that, then what do you have? And unfortunately, we know that they do not even bother making this claim. And if they did make this claim, we also know, hypothetically here, that it would have to match what the Word of God reveals by having the Word of God available. Like I've already said, like J.C. Bear has already taught all of us in this unique history lesson that is extremely important for all of our edification. Does God teach people to break his word? That's really what it comes to. Does God teach people to do something, call themselves apostolic, give them an office to teach things that don't line up with a single letter of this word, the Holy Bible? And once that's put in the proper perspective, that Acts chapter 8 isn't the only issue. We could go th all throughout the Bible and go to key passages such as he canceled the certificate of debt that was previously held against us, nailing all of our sins to the cross. This is speaking of what he did, what he has canceled out, what he has nailed to the cross. What we brought to the table was our filth, but it wasn't even something that was brought to the table by us at the time that the purchase was made. It was 100% solely monergistic, which means 100% the work of God. Synergistic would mean a cooperative effort. But I would dare say this goes beyond this term. I'll throw it over to J.C. Bear real quick. In terms of monergism versus synergism, where would Catholicism or Greek Orthodox, where would all these type of things fit? Or is this even the same category? I know it involves infusion and a lot of different things with the sacraments, but let me throw it back over to you for that one. Yeah, thank you, my friend. That, that's an excellent question. I think what we have to do to be responsible is to look at the specific tradition. So we talk here, Warfield gives us this perspective, and he paints a picture of evangelicalism versus sacerdotalism as if it were a binary. And in fact, there are different mixtures. So for example, Warfield is, was talking earlier about the Roman Catholic Church and its magisterium and its sacramental view. Even among Protestants, there are some folks who are more or less sacerdotal. And I think here, for example, about Lutherans. There are very many Lutherans in our social media circles who want to make a big deal about the necessity of baptism and baptismal regeneration. And that comes from a sacerdotal understanding of the Scriptures. So even though they're not Roman Catholics, we still see that holdover, that thinking. Now, it's not just the Lutherans. You can even go into Episcopal churches. And Warfield cites an Episcopal priest, Dr. A.G. Mortimer, who speaks of this idea, the chief means of grace are the sacraments. They are the channels by which the spiritual gift is conveyed to our souls. Baptism is absolutely necessary to salvation, for a person can have no life who has not been born. This is called the necessitas medii, since baptism is the means by which the supernatural life is given to the soul, and the individual is incorporated into Christ. Without the help of the Eucharist, salvation was so difficult to attain as to be practically impossible. Is there any room in this analysis for the Spirit to blow where and when it wills, to act when and how he acts? So we see that it's not just a binary situation, but different, different denominations have those different views. Now, what of it? Do we believe that baptism does not save? And are the sacerdotalists right in their criticism of us? And in fact, we have left out something absolutely necessary. Let's take a look. In the, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, talks about baptism and the Lord's Supper as being ordinances or sacraments, if you want to use the other wording. Now, in talking about baptism, we affirm that baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament, ordained by Christ, the confession says. To those baptized, it is a sign of their fellowship with him in his death and resurrection, of their being grafted into him, 
of remission of sins and submitting themselves to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. But now here's a question. Do we see baptism referred to only as a human administrated act, or do we see that baptism is spoken of also in relation to divine activity? And I think here the confession cites Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, when we think about this, who is doing the baptize? Well, there's two ideas going on. First is this spiritual activity of God. So we have a soteriology that talks about God monergistically acting to regenerate the human heart. Is that monergistic action dependent on or gating by the human administration of the sacrament of baptism? Or is the human administration of baptism simply a recognition and a reception by the church of the work, the monergistic divine work that has already taken place? That's the question we have to answer. If someone wishes to say that God monergistically acts through the Spirit working directly in the heart, and that regeneration precedes faith, then it's God, it's the Holy Spirit, who is birthing new souls into the kingdom of heaven. And when a Protestant minister holds a baptismal service, he's not birthing a new baby. He is celebrating, and he is receiving, and we are testifying as a church, recognizing what the Holy Spirit has already done. And so, that's a high-level response there. Bradster, I know I made it more complicated. Sorry about that. Did that get along the lines of what you were thinking? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up the confession. I love the Second London Baptist 1689 Confession, and I would strongly recommend all of you that are unaware of this confession to go online. You can read it for free. And they have it updated online. Do you have the website for that, JC? Yeah, there's a there's a really good copy of the 1689 Confession in Modern English at founders.org. And so we'll put a link in the description for the video so that folks can link over there. But this is exciting. And just remember, before we start hitting our sacerdotal brothers with golf clubs, and before we start letting them hit us with their golf clubs, let's remember that... The access to the scriptures that we have today, the access to scholarship around the text of the script is fabulous. It's a gift. If you want to see how God has blessed Western society, look at that. Now, there's a famous story that I heard. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. It's apocryphal. But I heard a story that during the time of Queen Victoria in the 19th century, at the peak of the British Empire, there was a diplomat who came to visit the queen, and the diplomat asked the queen, Your Highness, what is the secret to the success of the British Empire? How is it that you, only having this small island for your nation's territory, should be able to branch out and colonize and conquer so much of the world? And the story goes that she reached down, picked up a book, handed it to the ambassador and said, Mr. Ambassador, this is the secret to our success, and put into his hand a copy of the Holy Scriptures. I have found that true in my life, friends. Look, I don't know everything. I haven't lived forever. I haven't seen everything there is to see. But in my years, I have found the Scriptures vindicated, and I have found that over time, those who treasure God and who value his holy scriptures, as their highest treasures above all, are generally blessed, and those who do not are generally cursed. I'm very taken by that. Now, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one experience, but I've been around for enough years to see the scriptures vindicated in my own personal experience. So take it for what it's worth. I think the secret to my success is that someone handed me a copy of the scriptures and said, make these your greatest treasure. And 
I have, and my family has, and God has been so good to me. Brother, let me throw it over to you for some final thoughts here today. We know there's a lot of different kind of theologies out there. There's a lot that has happened over the history of the church. But the simple fact that you have a history means you have a family, means you have something real to hold on to. The scriptures have always agreed. Genesis all the way through Revelation. Moses all the way through David, all the way through Christ, all the way through us. Now, the unique thing that we see is most people argue about the differences. But one common thing we all have in is the faith that is given us by God. That being said, I'll throw it over to my good friend, J.C. Bear for a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for giving us a treasure that the scriptures themselves say is even better than gold. Lord, thank you for being God in our lives. Thank you for the kingdom of Christ, and thank you that kingdom continues in the person and head of your own Holy Spirit, working and acting, blowing like the wind, accomplishing your divine purpose in everything and with everyone. Lord, thank you for my brother. I lift him up. I pray for his blessing and his family's blessing. Lord, I lift up our listeners and say thank you for them and let them be blessed, Lord God. Lord, act in our land. Let us treasure you, Lord God. Pour out your spirit among us. We pray that you would draw many to salvation. We worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, brother.